Be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to Dale Borglum's Healing at the Edge. We are very happy to share with you Dale's profound insight and open heart. Please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Dale to support this podcast. Welcome, everybody. Hi, Dale. Hi there, Chris. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. It's almost the end of summer. Uh, getting chilly in the evenings. So there's not a lot of smoke in the air. The fires went the other direction. Life is good. That's good. All right. So we're talking about the subject of inhabiting the body as a path to spiritual awakening. And let's kick this off. And why is this an important topic to you? And what do you mean by, I guess the whole conversation will be about inhabiting the body as a path to awakening. So where would you like to start? Well, maybe I could start with some personal observations about my own path. Uh, I have uh, uh, advanced training in mathematics. I have a PhD in mathematics. And that's, that's training to be in the head, right? That's, a, that's training to understand, to categorize, to differentiate and in trying to work with my mind and just deal with how, how tight my mind was, I kept again and again coming back to my body. When I was a Stanford graduate student and I was just beginning all this, this uh, body practice, I, I was Rolf by Rolf herself. Uh, I uh, was doing intensive yoga. I was doing yoga to the point where I was swallowing cloths, moving them around in my intestines, and then pulling them out. And I was a fruitarian for uh, an extended period of time, eating nothing that didn't fall off a tree and, and doing intense breathing practices hmm. uh, and really trying to purify myself. There was some judeo-christian guilt i had i thought if i could purify my body enough that god might like me better and uh it was useful i guess in purifying my body to a certain extent but a lot of what i was doing was based on a rejection of my body of trying to fix it of trying to get the toxins out taking colonics and breathing only in certain ways and eating only certain things and maybe that's a place where most of us have to start but i then went off to india and i met maharaji and living in india you can't really eat a pure diet you're eating sugar and grease and white flour all the time and yet it was being given to me by what it seemed to me to be God incarnate, I'm going to say, no, that's not whole wheat flour, that's white bread flour. I don't want that. Obviously, you couldn't say that. So it began to relax some of these, these ideas I had about my body that, that uh, I had to be pure and I had to be all the time uh, distinguishing between pure and impure. And I, I started getting involved then in some therapies that, combined the body and the mind. And what really kind of shocked me, Chris, was that even though I had done all this intensive yoga and I had done all these, these uh, Goenka meditation retreats where you're sweeping attention through the body mm. for 10, 12, 14, 16 hours a day toward the end, sitting there just paying attention to the body, even after all of that, when I got into these body-based therapies, there were parts of my body I couldn't feel. They were so numb. Hmm. I had a, a hole in my lower belly, uh, not literally, but energetically. I couldn't feel down below my navel. It was like hmm. a blank. And this woman I was working with said, okay, bring your attention there. And I said, I don't want to do it. Or maybe I didn't say it quite like that, but she kind of had to hold my hand. And every time I was able to go beyond all this resistance and really begin to inhabit that place. It felt just wonderful. So uh, this whole conversation about the body is 
really, to me, a reflection of the, the stages of spiritual development. And in the beginning, we do have to work with uh, the lower body, uh, the getting grounded, getting centered, noticing how when certain stressors come, we space out, we get in our mind, we fixate on the triggers instead of being present in our body. Uh, if, if something stressful happens, very often the first reaction is creating a story about what's happening out there so we can relate to it, understand it, deal with it, rather than trusting our body, dropping into our body to respond, mm. right? So uh, I found after like 20 years of meditation and, and 20 years of yoga and all these things, that I wasn't particularly grounded and centered. In fact, that I was using yoga and meditation to get beyond my body, mm. to kind of spiritually bypass what was difficult. Mm. And I had to go back then and begin to inhabit my body, in, in particularly down in the lower chakras, because a lot of people will approach spirituality as, I want to get free, I want my heart to open, I want to dissolve into God, I want to dissolve into pure spaciousness. And they're not noticing that their feet really aren't on the ground and they're not particularly centered. Hmm. So, You've done a lot of talking. Yeah, I'll let you yeah. jump in a little bit. You've lived in a lot of communities where you've been aware of these types of body-based practices. A lot of people listening might not know even what rolfing is. Uh, what was the turning point for you that you um, were drawn to the body-based therapies, or uh, how did and, and how do you find somebody who can help you with that? Because this is body-based therapies. A lot of people know about talk therapy, um, but or or body work. Yeah, that is just done to you. But some of this work is done with. Uh, like you mentioned earlier with Goenka body scans, tuning into sensations. Uh, my question is, uh, how did you make that discovery, that switch and that exploration in this area? Was it after that you found it wasn't working, the, the path you were taking wasn't working and you found this other path? Yeah, that's a great question. And I wish I had a really simple, great answer. Uh, to me, it's like a lot of what you could call co-regulating or going into healing and then coming back into life and back and forth and back and forth informing each other. So that in the beginning, for instance, I was doing all this yoga. Uh, I went off to India and then there was all the bad food. Uh, I'm not really answering your question here. How can I say this? Uh, again and again at various stages of my path, I would realize that I was kind of stuck. I, I, I was in psychotherapy uh, when my father was dying and, uh, for a while, and I realized that this is a lovely therapist, and I was self-revealing enough that I felt I was almost getting my money's worth, but not enough so anything was really happening, mm. that I was as smarter, smarter than the therapist and kind of fooling myself and thinking I was fooling her. Uh, and again and again, I would be in one kind of therapy and kind of reach the end, or at least the end for me, I would start feeling kind of stuck and I would kind of give up and wait for the next thing to happen. So to me, it wasn't really so much about what's the best thing to do, but finding the right people, finding people that know more than you do. Mm. Uh, maybe not know more about everything, but know more about a particular thing. Is there somebody you trust with your body? Like when you're getting rolfed or when you have a, a really good yoga teacher, you're really putting your, your body in somebody's hands and right. letting them kind of reform it. And mm. Uh, I used to travel around teaching a lot of workshops before COVID and even a long time ago when I was running the Dying Center, teaching dozens of workshops every every year. And a lot of people would say, oh, it's so nice you've come to our community. Can I give you a massage? And I said, oh, it's so nice you want to give me a massage. And people would massage me. And at the end, I'd feel like I needed a massage hmm. or that, that, that uh, 
they had kind of put some of their concepts into my body, if you will. Right. I don't know how to put I, it. I was talking about that with a friend when we were talking about, um, a friend and I were talking about this particular conversation that you and I were going to have uh, about how do you find somebody who's safe to work with, you you trust, who's not pushing their agenda on you. And uh, yeah. maybe it comes back to those body sensations uh, and being more aware of your intuition and what your body tells you know the body uh, keeps the score. What what the body tells you, not just using your mind, you know, for this type yeah. of thing. If you're grounded and centered enough, you will be feeling the energy of the other person. If you're up in your mind and you're feeling you're desperate for healing, hmm. you'll be missing a lot of signals. There have been some studies done recently that that show something that I think is quite remarkable. In that, uh, they found that unmindful stress causes inflammation and illness. But mindful stress barely does it all. Unmindful and mindful stress are two radically different things. Hmm. Stress is not bad. Being lost in stress is bad. Being unaware of the stress. Stress is something that keeps us moving. It keeps us creating. Hmm. It keeps us uh, opening into relationship. But when we have some of this early childhood conditioning where certain stressors arise and we get just caught in guilt or shame or anxiety, it becomes very difficult to stay embodied. So that question you asked before that I didn't answer too well of how do I find somebody, to me it's a matter of going through these stages of, first of all, Trusting being embodied, uh, getting grounded, getting centered, having an embodied mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Not just mindful, but an embodied mindfulness. You can be aware of what's going on in your life and stay in your body. And then as, as practice deepens, we have a more heartfelt embodiment where we're uh, feeling the pain in our body, the pain in other people's bodies, and keeping our hearts open. Hmm. Being able to experience pain and not get lost in suffering. Can I be with pain in my body and not suffer? Can I go to the, I mean, I was at the dentist a while back and she wanted to, she was, I had a cavity under a crown and she was going to uh, take the crown off and drill on the, on the decay and put a new crown on. And she said, well, it's going to hurt. It's a live nerve there. I'm going to give you a shot. I said, I don't want a shot. <laughs> she said, oh, no, it's going to hurt. I said, well, I know there's going to be pain, but I don't want a shot. I don't want to have that weird thing all afternoon where I can't talk on the chemicals in my bloodstream. And she she kept insisting that I should really get the shot. And I kept saying, no, it's okay. So she called in her husband, who was a bigger dentist. And he said, you should get the shot. I said, no, it's okay. And she drilled on my nerve, and it really hurt for about 60 or 90 seconds. I just relaxed. I felt pain. But I didn't suffer. I was I had I was having this loving relationship with these sensations. Right. They and were that, very they were very intense. I was I was yeah. not resisting them. And I imagine you started with a a smaller um smaller sensation along the way, learn how to deal with smaller things before you jumped into the deep end of of that uh dental <laughs> that dentistry. That well, I'm not saying anybody should do that. I mean, some people have more emotional reactions about dental work but uh, earlier on when i was doing a lot of meditating there's a lot of pain in my body mm. i i would sit cross-legged for sometimes uh 14 16 hours a day and uh, apparently buddha had a bad back according to what i've heard so sitting still will will uncover the pain in your body. You can try an experiment. Find the most comfortable position you can find, which is probably lying flat on your back on your bed, and see if you can lie still for an hour hmm. and watch the sensations come. And it'll be, it, as you relax, it will uncover the pain in your body. They say that actually the most difficult yoga asana to do properly is the corpse pose. Hmm. Because to do it, you have to completely relax. To do it properly, you have to completely relax. All the other poses, you're, you know, using your muscles in a certain way. Yeah. So is there a connection between, uh, let's say, faith and trusting in the ground and relaxation and this, um, I guess, spiritual faith 
in a way that that you can relax. I think in my life, I or I see, and this is sometimes me, that I feel like, oh, I can relax when I get everything done. You know, it's like that's this is work time, this is stress time. Stress is normal, uh, but it's like being very hard on myself and, and not trusting um, that I could. I don't need to live in a constant stress pattern. And uh, I'm not sure where I was going with that. But, well, but uh, what was coming yeah. up in my mind as you were talking was that it's a perfect example of working with embodiment. Is it possible that you can be having a busy day? I mean, I know you work at some, at least part of the time in the tech industry. You're on the computer. You're on the phone. You're using your rational mind to figure things out. Right. Is it possible you can do those things and be grounded and centered and energized and there's stress, but you're not getting lost in the stress. Hmm. So that, I mean, somebody asked, I was on a hike yesterday with an old friend of mine and she said, how, what's going on in your life? I said, you know, it's kind of like everything's the same. It's sometimes I'm meditating. Sometimes I'm not sometimes eating. Sometimes I'm not. Sometimes it's hot. Sometimes it's cold. And I can't tell if I'm almost enlightened or if I'm really depressed, <laughs> right? Because it, it all it all is kind of the same. That is, I'm going further down the path. It's not like, oh, I can't get wait to get done working so I can have uh, a meal and turn on Netflix. Or I can't wait to get done being on the computer so I can go out and hike, right? That it's all, it's all me being in my body and my mind. And we were talking before about getting to the heart stage of embodiment, of having this more loving relationship with sensations and with your body and not having an adversarial, I've got to fix my body kind of thing. But then after we go into the heart, the next stage is the, the tantric or the empowerment stage where that even the difficult sensations are reflections of God's face. Hmm. Somebody asked Maharaji, what's the best form to worship God? He said, every form, right? See, see everything is God. So that's just not the pleasant sensations. It's the unpleasant sensations. It's all the divine mother. That pain in your knee or pain in your back is just as much the mother as re relaxation or stress when you're working at the computer is just as much God as walking on Mount Tam on a sunny California afternoon. But it's hard to fully appreciate that if we haven't gone through these other embodiment stages of really having this embodied mindfulness and this open-hearted embodiment. So now we're talking about tantric embodiment, seeing the, the sacred nature of embodiment itself. Uh, I work a lot with dying people. People have cancer. People have ALS. People have Alzheimer's disease. And it's very easy to get caught in comparing, oh, here's the way I feel now compared to how I was six months ago. This is a big problem. Well, it might, it might be painful. It might be debilitating in other ways. It might be expensive. It might be leading to death. But in that moment, there you are. That's your body. Can you be inhabiting that body when when cancer's in your body? Or are you saying, oh, my God, I don't want to be here. I want to be somewhere else. But you, you're not somewhere else. You're in that body. So that can we have that that honoring the mother when the mother is, is wrathful, when the mother is chaotic? Hmm. And in Tantra, they really honor the chaotic because the stronger the sensation, the stronger the emotion, the stronger the experience, the more intense, the greater the opportunity for awakening. Mm. And so you that, said, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Right. You go and ahead. you said before that people don't uh, I'll go ahead. start with Tantra, they start with yoga, or yoga is more advised, it's more advisable to, to start on a yogic path as opposed to a Tantric path. You don't have to call it yoga or tantra, but uh, to uh, develop mindfulness, embodied mindfulness, to develop devotion and compassion, then when we're inhabiting the heart, the nature of the heart is spacious. The nature of the heart is connected, of the open heart. So if the heart is spacious enough, if we begin to realize its boundless nature, then the ego structure is still there, but it's just one little thing in the vast sky of mind. It's not 
right in, in front of your face all the time. And then empowerment begins to arise naturally. As long as I think I've got to fix my body, and there's all the eyes and the mys in the sentence, then Tantra is not going to be there so much. But Tantra, there's still, there's still the, the I, but it's the I, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the sacred part of I, if you will. It's what I invoked in the beginning when you're in, invoking Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. Or it, it's your true nature. You're, you're beginning to appreciate that, yeah, I've got a body and the body's finite and I've got a personality and the personality's neurotic. And it's, it's, it's beyond pure and impure. It's all sacred. It's all of this one taste of, of it's all a face of God, a face of the mother. Hmm. So that now you're not having this, this uh, adversarial relationship with your body that I've got to fix my body. In fact, in Tantra, they see the body as the microcosm of the whole universe. Hmm. That it, it, if you can love your body and, and open to your body, you're opening to everything. You're opening hmm. to all the people and all the wars and all the confusion and all the violence. Because all that's in the body. How do you find working on the computer? We've all been spending a lot more time on the computer in the yeah. past year and a half. Uh, I love my computer. <laughs> how do you do? You remember to stay embodied when you're, you know, you're frozen in, in your chair. Uh, do you have any tips for how you reconnect? Well, uh, yeah, I have a bunch of tips. I, uh, you know, they're not big secrets. Uh, one thing is, I'm really a big fan of good posture. Hmm. You know, I've got I've got a, a fancy chair and I've got a foot rest thing. So I can be sitting where there's very little fighting of gravity. My, my spine is, my, my head is on my neck. My neck is on my shoulders. Mm. My shoulders are over my torso. My torso is on my hips. And my hips are, are just right there on the chair, right? And so I'm not fighting gravity. I can get really relaxed. And the other thing is I'm really a, a big fan of, Super short meditations, you know, like 10 seconds, 20 seconds that uh, so many times you're waiting for a, a website to load or, you know, there's, there's, there's little breaks in, in, the, in the workflow, right? And you just say a mantra a few times or you, you, you just take a few grounding and centering breaths or you realize that... Uh, you look around the room and it's all the divine mother smiling back at you or, you know, whatever, whatever your drug of choice is here, you, you realize that the world is a dream as well as it's really real. Hmm. So that the, the, the essence of Tantra, a tantric relationship of, with reality uh, is in uh, distinction to the Western worldview. The Western worldview is that you and I and everybody are separate beings perceiving an objective, solid reality out there through our perceiving mechanisms. We're seeing, touching, smelling, hearing, and tasting the solid reality. And if I hold up my computer mouse here for you to see, you're seeing exactly the same thing I'm seeing right? Hmm. And tantric wisdom of ancient Hinduism and Buddhism says something that modern quantum mechanics has mathematically proven, which is that that is completely backwards. And Dale, you might be one of the few people qualified to actually <laughs> bring that up with your PhD in mathematics, because I think a lot of people who don't know math ascribe to the same, um, you know, well, no, I, you know, my conditioning ascribes to that too, and I have not, I have not studied quantum mechanics. To, I mean, I've read books by people who I trust who say this. I, I, I have, I really feel that intellectualism is is one of the more serious spiritual diseases, which I've tried to go beyond, uh, maybe to my detriment, kind of throwing the mind aside and trusting the heart and the body. Because the, the mind almost did me in. But what I'm saying is that Tantra says there's just 
one consciousness flowing through us individual filters creating reality so that occasionally i'll be sitting here i just happened today i was working with somebody i'm working on my book with she's helping me write a book and i had this experience we were talking the computers were out we had notes we were talking from and putting a chapter together and i had the experience that I was not the body. I was outside the body watching this Dale person talk and hearing the other person responding. And we were having this conversation and it was all like I was at the movies or it was kind of some dream sequence. And somebody once asked Maharaji, well, is the world real or is it a dream? He says, it's completely a dream. Mm. It's completely real. And it's both at the same time. Mm. So that, one of the ways I don't get completely sucked into the computer screen, screen the computer scream, that's an interesting Freudian <laughs> slip-up, <laughs> uh, is remembering that the, the computer and my relationship with it is really not what it completely seems to be, that I'm, I'm creating this experience. Mm. So I can do it in a relaxed way, I can do it in an exciting way, but I don't have to get all uh, lost in stress that... Uh, it's not going as quickly as I thought, or this this program isn't doing what I hoped it would do, or whatever the situation might be. Mm. And the last point I'd like to make is we can even take it a step beyond tantra into non-dual embodiment. So let's if you're take really, it. Let's, let's take that step, Dale. <laughs> Here we go. So so right now you can feel the energy in your body right you let's let's say that the listeners and you and me are we're we're in our body we're not fighting gravity too much we have pretty good posture and you can you can feel the sensations in your body you're aware of the energy in your body changing every moment can you begin to expand your awareness so you begin to exp experience the energy outside of your body can you can awareness expand so that you're not just this bag of skin, that you're filling the room that you're sitting in. And that if somebody else were in the room, they would be in this energy field with you. And they would be, in some sense, one with you. So uh, you can do this with your computer. <laughs> you can do this <laughs> with your, your automobile. You could do this with your partner. Right, that it's that you're embodied, but you're not saying I'm embodied. That my embodiment stops where my skin starts. No, that it's 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 pure consciousness. It's it's creating reality moment to moment to moment. Hmm. I've got a teenage son who's very curious about these things, and he keeps wondering how do we know we're not in a uh, some beta testing computer game for some alien, right? I mean, they, I mean, there's no way to know that we're not, right? And that, and that they're, they're, they're tweaking the degree of, of pixelation and, and refinement and all this kind of, anyway, we don't have to go f too far down that road. You know that quote about the world is as you are? Have you heard that? the world it, variations on that. I mean, in a sense, we are like, we are the microcosm for, for the larger yeah. world. And I realize the more um, calm and peaceful and centered uh, I become, my experience of everyone, everything and everyone becomes more beautiful. I mean, things literally sparkle. People become kinder. I mean, when I, within me, when I change, really my experience of the world changes. Yeah. I don't think that's a, that's not groundbreaking, but in a way, uh, it is to, for me to realize that. And that means there's more responsibility within myself to take care, to, to realize it's within me and not so much of like that great quote you said, uh, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic to get everything right so that I can feel good. I can almost start with feeling good or, feel, or feeling everything, accepting everything as it is. Right. Then not. We don't, uh, we're not grateful because uh, things feel good. Things feel good because we're grateful. Hmm. Somebody said so that, I mean, can you be, can you be grateful no matter what it is that's going on? That's really a tantric practice. Can you be grateful for the future that hasn't happened yet? 
Mm. when you don't know if it's going to be uh, pleasant or unpleasant. But it's life. It's, it's, it's the mother unfolding. You've talked about the qualities of the heart. Let's see if I remember them. Spacious, connected, warm. Uh-huh. Uh, what are of the, the qualities open heart. Of the open heart. Yeah. What are the qualities of, of gratitude? If, if we were to get a felt sense in the body and the, I guess, is it similar to the heart, an open heart? Yeah. The, uh, so the open heart expresses itself in the way that's appropriate to the immediate situation. So the open heart can be expressed as loving kindness, as compassion, as forgiveness, as gratitude, as devotion. They're all expressions of the open heart, just depending on what your relationship is with the environment. So that if there's suffering and you are in the other person, your heart's open, it's compassion. If you're looking at somebody you really care about and there's not suffering, it's loving kindness. If uh, forgiveness is needed and your heart is open, that you need to forgive somebody, they need to forgive you, or you need to forgive yourself, then there's forgiveness. If mm-hmm. if uh, if you're thinking about God or the deity or the guru or something, then it's devotion. And, and gratitude, just, I don't know, it, it can be done as a practice, but to me it just brings spontaneously when I just, I, I just enjoy the aliveness, the, the, the beingness mm. of experience that mm. there's a kind of joyfulness so that yeah. this person, Brene Brown, who has had one of the, has one of the most popular Ted talks. She, she said she had, I think 12,000 data points, which I believe are people, right. And she had, she had, uh, she asked these people all these questions and a number of these people felt joy and every one of the people that reported they felt joy in their life did gratitude practice Mm -hmm. so there can be some very non-joyful meditators there can be grumpy meditators there can be grumpy yogis but if your heart's open if you're feeling gratitude for this life you're going to feel joy Hmm. yeah there's that uh that that heart path, as well as the, as well as the the mindfulness. I mean, it, it seems like things start with a mindful path and being aware of of your thoughts. And like you said, it can be too cold without a, without a, um, whether it be heart heart based or devotional practice as well. It sounds it sounds like they complement each other. What's uh. Have you ever worked with uh, Brother David Stendelrast? I know his before. I haven't around. worked with. Uh, I've I've met him. He's a really beautiful guy. I heard him. He spoke at Green Gulch Zen Center a whole number of years ago, and I went. I drove out there to hear him speak, and I I think he's quite delightful. I don't know him personally. Yeah. I mean, his main thing is gratitude, of course. He says right. gratitude is all you need. If you're grateful, then everything else will take care of itself. Hmm. Yeah, uh, gratitude journals and gratitude practices are really in the mainstream of the the self help uh, genre, perhaps per- personal development genre that's out there today. So it's, um, of course, I guess it's as old as time, but uh, it's, it's finding a a place in culture. That in adult coloring books. So why not, right? Okay, adult coloring books. The first thing I thought it had adult content, but it's just coloring books for adults. Oh, you know, <laughs> there's a there's a an idea within an idea there. Okay, uh, I, I'd like to go back. I'd like to go back to the gratitude. So I think it's great to have gratitude journals, but I think it's really also super interesting to. That's a stupid word. I think it's wonderful to bring gratitude into like a moment to moment practice. You're not, it's not like the end of the day and you say, what are three things I'm grateful for? That's fine. That's great. But can you have a gratitude practice? That's like, as you're, as you're working at your computer, as you're driving to your job, as you're eating your Cheerios in the morning or whatever, granola, whatever, that there's just a, a sense of gratitude that you keep coming back to. 
mm. that it's an ongoing thing. It's like it's there's a mindfulness practice, there's a compassion practice, there's a gratitude practice. That it's not it's not just these big things that I've got this nice car and my son is is healthy and I got a roof over my head <laughs> and uh, I'm not dead yet or something. But that you're you have gratitude for this next breath. You have gratitude for what it feels like that your butt is on the chair, those mm-hmm. sensations that are tingling, or you have gratitude for the way that you and I have known each other for all these years and how we put up with each other and still keep coming back for more. <laughs> <laughs> right? True. That's true. That's great. Well, let's see. So we've covered Tantra. We've covered uh, practitioners, your experience along the way, and uh, the importance of this this type of work. Anything else you'd like to cover? Not really. I mean, just in summary, I think uh, the body channel of healing is a very important one for many people. Vander Kock's title of his book, The Body Keeps the Score, I think is really prescient and that mm. that trauma is locked in the body. Uh, and Peter Levine and other people say, it's something I'm saying too, is that we really can't heal trauma until we're embodied. We have to be willing to be in the body before we can let go of what's trapped in the body. So uh, for many people in the West... Being in uh, having an embodied channel as part of our practice, whether it's yoga or walking in nature or having some kind of body work for some sophisticated person. And uh, in, in that realm, I think it's important to find somebody that you really trust that that's more important than what kind of body work it is. But what's important is who is yeah. the person doing it. Uh, I really love uh feldenkrais and alexander and uh some of these more sophisticated ways of inhabiting our body yeah. but it, it really, a call me therapists are a call me reiki wonderful. reiki and therapy bioenergetics mm. uh you mentioned rolfing or structural integration earlier the uh Chine san i mean there's so many different completely valid paths to healing i mean basically in chinese medicine they they say the whole body all the acupuncture points are in each ear or on Mm. each foot right so you could just do foot massage or ear massage or uh i i go to a chinese medical practitioner who's been my main healthcare provider has kept me relatively healthy for the last uh since when since 1975 so I don't know, 45 years or something like that. He's mm. been my doctor. Oh. And I want to give a shout out to Chi Nhat San again, the internal organ Chi massage. I, I, I know a lot of people don't really, I've even talked to body workers and massage therapists. I said, you know about this? And they don't. It's work on the, it's a work on the uh, abdominal area and moving the, the trapped, undigested emotions and, uh, and actually physical material there. And it's, uh, been pretty wonderful. It's a really unique um, uh, practice. And I think it's, and to me, it's like a place we often don't want to be touched in our stomachs. We, that's where we, we guard those things, you know, that's where you get tickled. And so when you go to a, a Chi Nhat San practitioner, they're, they're diving right in, hopefully in a very gentle way at the start. And uh, I think you and I have the same or have met the same uh, teacher and practitioner in the area. I'm not so sure Chine San is available throughout America. I think it might be a West Coast, Northern California thing more. Yeah. That The teacher that we're talking about has taught students around here, but I'm not sure if you're living yeah. in Chicago or Tallahassee, you're going to find a Chine San practitioner. Definitely fewer. I, if you go on, uh, <laughs> I'm making a pitch for this person, but if you, if you Google uh, Chine San Are you getting a, a cut here, uh, Chris? I, is, no. <laughs> Gilles no. is paying you to do this, isn't he? I can see it. I was just waiting for you to mention it so I could give this infomercial. Uh, I just think it's so interesting. But um, So with that, <laughs> with that, 
I hope everybody listened to their body while they were uh, listening to this podcast. And if that, yeah. It's been great to be with you. Yeah, my great body's to be with happy. You. I'm happy. Me too. I'm grateful, Dale. I'll talk to you soon. Lots of love to you and to everybody. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.